Tennessee is an all-everything school right now. Yeah, there's no ifs, ands, buts about it. The big five sports, the big revenue-driving sports are all in one cohesive pattern. And what's interesting about that is not one athletic director hired multiple coaches. That, some locked-on polls that are super interesting in the Southeastern Conference, and more Omaha Vols talk here on your Wednesday Locked On Balls. You are Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey everybody, happy Wednesday and welcome into it. This is Locked On Vols, your team every single day, a part of Locked On Podcast Network. Thanks so much for making us your first listen each and every day and for following and liking us, subscribing to us on Locked On Balls on the YouTube channel, and of course, wherever you get your podcast. I'm Eric Kane. You can always find this show and find me on Twitter at underscore Kaner and at Locked On Balls. And today's episode is brought to you in part by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on college. And when you enter the promo code locked on college, it'll throw in a free custom bird dogs Yeti style tumbler uh, with every single order. Go ahead and check out bird dogs today. We got a fun show coming up today. I- I'm really excited to uh, kind of get into uh, some of the nitty gritty right now. You know, Tennessee, the, the at vol underscore sports uh, Twitter account put out um, a graphic on Tuesday after Tennessee's birth into the college world series for baseball. We'll talk about that in a little bit more in, in segment three, but um, it's an all-everything school, and we say that and we throw that around there a little bit, but really when you look down into it, it's really interesting how great Tennessee athletics is, um, you know, athletic athletic department-wide, and what's more interesting is um, different athletic directors made these higher, so I want to get into that a little bit in segment one. Segment two, locked on um, host from around the SEC, voted and compiled some different polls uh, in terms of, you know, for this upcoming season, we're going to go over a couple of those. A couple of those I got a real gripe with in terms of fan bases, top five offenses, all that type of stuff in segment two. And then some more baseball notes. We're going to hear that final call from John Wilkerson in segment three. So um, early on Tuesday morning, and as you can see, I'm back in my home studio. I'm really, really happy to, to be out of Hattiesburg. It is good to be home. It is good to be back in East Tennessee, only if it is for just a few days before I head back out to Omaha. Uh, but it's good to be home, and I was super thrilled. Uh, nearly an all-nighter, you know, covering Tennessee's birth in the College World Series in Hattiesburg, winning that Super Regional. Um, got kicked out of the stadium. Of course, the game didn't start until uh, you know after 10 o'clock Eastern time, and I had to finish up my work and only got you know a little over an hour's worth of sleep and had to turn around and come back to Jeff City. That's a long drive, or to Knoxville, excuse me. Jeff City's my hometown. Uh, so it's, it's been a long day, but, um, really, really exciting times. And this is why you do it. So I'm really, I'm really thrilled, uh, uh, to be able to do a, a whole lot of this. But, uh, when I was riding shotgun on the drive early Tuesday morning, I saw the university of 20, uh, Tennessee, they put out this graphic and it got me thinking a little bit. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to flash this graphic up and you can see it. Uh, but for those of you guys listening right now, it says everything period. It's got uh, you know some cutouts of Joe Milton, some Lady Balls basketball players, softball players, Jemai Mayshack of basketball, Christian Moore of Tennessee baseball, and and the text says only school since 1998 to win a BCS slash New Year's Six bowl bowl game, advance to the men's and women's basketball Sweet 16, advance to the men's and women's College World Series, all in the same academic year. And Larry chimed in uh, on the DMs, you know, a couple of days ago, and or really, I, I guess it was after uh, Tennessee punched its stick at Omaha and said, "This has got to be one of the best years in Tennessee athletics history, right?" And I would agree. I mean, really, you had the turnaround in football. Uh, you had the turnaround in football where you won eleven games, ten games in the regular season. You took down two of your arch rivals. You beat Alabama, snapped that streak. You went on. You had a Blimikoff Award winner. You had a guy that should have been a Heisman finalist. You won a prestigious bowl game in Clemson and the Orange Bowl. <clears throat> and so football, what, you know, turns the lights on for everybody else, right? It, it's it, it's it's going back in the right direction. You have men's basketball that was up and down, up and down, up and down, and, and uh, then you lose your starting point guard, and, and then you make a run of the Sweet 16. You have women's basketball that dealt with some injuries as well but made a run to the Sweet 16. You have, uh, <laughs> you know, the Lady Vol softball team that advanced – all the way to Oklahoma City, uh, won a game, and um, you know we're you know, we're right there and had a chance to win it all. And then of course you have Tony Vitello's club in Tennessee baseball that punched its tickets 
to Omaha for the second time in the past three seasons, sixth time overall. And so those are the big five, if you will, right? Those are the ones that, you know, outside of football and men's basketball, really there's not much revenue that's drawn from some other sports, but these are considered the big five. And what's interesting when you dig down deep into it, (laughs) uh, you know, you've got five different athletic directors who made these five hires. It's really interesting, okay? Let's start with Rick Barnes. He was hired by Dave Hart. Uh, let's go to Tony Vitello. He was hired by John Curry. Uh, Philip Former, he hired Kelly Har- Harper. Of course, Danny White hired Josh Heupel. And Joan Cronin hired Ralph and Karen Weekly back in the day. So it- it's really interesting when you look at the five big you know sports um, in-, in terms of the University of Tennessee and really uh, across athletics. You know, you got men's and women's basketball, football, uh, softball and baseball that consider the big five. All of those head coaches are were hired by five different athletic directors. The cohesiveness, the um, alignment has not always been there. Tennessee's had some tough, tough days in terms of going through athletic departments or athletic directors. The athletic department and the administration not being on the same page. The ADs and the chancellor not being on the same page. Lack of support from the university president for athletics. There's been a lot of that over the last couple of, you know, 10, 15, you know, two decades at University of Tennessee. But right now, you are about as aligned as you've ever been. And, uh, you know, tip of the cap, and I think it's uh, I think it's a big credit to University President Randy Boyd uh, for believing and for uh, investing and, you know, having a, a big hand in what's going on on the athletic fields. Uh, Dante Plowman, who works hand-in-hand with Randy Boyd, and who is the ambassador, if you will, from administrations to the athletic department as, as UT chancellor. And of course, Danny White, who is the athletic director who works, you know, with both those with those two uh, aforementioned Randy Boyd and Dante Plowman. The alignment, the vision, the the future, um, what once what needs to be accomplished here at the University of Tennessee, all three of those individuals are on the same wavelength. And I you can't say that at a lot of places around the SEC. You can't say that a lot of places around the country, and certainly that's not been the case here on Rocky Top, you know, in in years past. So even though there's been some bad tenures of athletic directors, the way John Curry's tenure here at Tennessee ended was horribly. Uh, You know, Dave Hart, uh, Philip Former, of course, um, you know, retired uh, during the Jeremy Pruitt uh, situation. Um, You know, there's 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 been some dark days, if you will, but. Uh, you know, all five of these head coaches hired by five different athletic directors. I think that's pretty neat. And, you know, Tennessee now with with punching a ticket into the College World Series, you've got the athletic department, you know, athletic department wide sitting at number 10 in the Director's Cup standings right now. And that's, you know, essentially to see who's the best athletic department around the country, not just the Southeastern Conference, not just this region. Uh, but across the country, and it, it's on a point system. And you know, because Tennessee just punched its ticket to, the, to Omaha in the College World Series, it was awarded 73 more points. And so Tennessee is is going to outpace some of the other teams currently inside the top 10. So again, that just speaks some volume. So there's a lot going on right now at the University of Tennessee um, this past season, this past academic year in particular. Larry's exactly right. Football. It is what drives the ship. When football is right, everything else can be right. It's hard to be right athletic department wide when football is not right. And the hire Danny White made for Josh Heupel, going to get in this guy and bringing it here, obviously it's proved to be a great hire so far. Uh, football was incredible the year that it had. Basketball was frustrating, but still you made a run, had an opportunity to go to a regional final and to an Elite Eight. Women's basketball, the same thing. Went on a run, had an opportunity to go to a regional final. And then softball had a chance to win it all, and UT baseball is now one of the last eight teams standing, has a chance to win it all. It has been a great, great academic year here right on Rocky Top. I'm going to flash that graphic up here one more time. And everything school, the only school since 1998 to win a BCS New York Six Bowl game, advance to the men's and women's basketball Sweet 16, advance to the men's and women's College World Series, all in the same academic year. No other athletic department has done that since 1998. It's a pretty daggone great accomplishment, if you ask me. So uh, Danny White is doing a great job. I think he is a great athletic director. But the success that's happening right now shouldn't only be attributed to him. Okay, There were plans in place for renovations. There were plans in place for Nealon and for Lindsey Nelson and 
Uh, you know, all this type of stuff that were already in place before he got here. Uh, he's getting them done, and he's doing a lot of other, you know, uh, great stuff, innovative stuff. And, of course, he made the hire of Josh Heupel. But uh, the alignment, the vision, it's all one with Randy Boyd, Don Plowman, and Danny White. And I just think that's uh, it's awesome. It's it's a really, really good time to be here on Rocky Top, that is for sure. Hey, when we come back, Locked On host around the SEC put out some polls and, um, you know, about this upcoming season. And, and I've got... I got a bone to pick with a couple of these guys, okay? And uh, you don't want to miss this next segment. It's going to be really, really interesting. So that's coming up next right here on Locked On Balls. But, hey, I want to tell you about our friends over at Bird Dogs, okay? They make you look good. Bird Dog stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and to give uh, to, and your leg to give you that truly sculpted look. Uh, Bird Dog shorts do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but fit way better. They fit way better than regular shorts that are made of stiff, restricted cotton. But what Bird Dogs does is they fix the issue by inventing a cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so that you can get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. It also uses an anti-stick sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool dry all day long. Versatility. Flexibility comfort you can go to a meeting a business meeting wearing your bird dogs khaki pants or your shorts okay you can go on a date you can go to the bar with the boys you can go out and you know play frisbee golf whatever the case may be the versatility the comfort the flexibility you can get it all with bird dogs and right now you can go to birddogs.com uh, slash locked on college then enter the promo code locked on college for a free yeti style tumbler with your order that's birddogs.com slash locked on college for a free Yeti style tumbler. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. I promise you that. All right, guys and gals, welcome back into it. Your Wednesday edition of the show will be Omaha bound later this week. I've got a flight out of Knoxville. It's cutting a little close. I'm not too happy about that. But um, when Omaha literally <laughs> gets in the green off of one week uh, a year and having all these teams and these fan bases and this media contingent, uh, going to Omaha, it's, it's difficult to find flights. It's difficult to find lodging, and you know, getting all that worked out. Um, <laughs> it it was it was kind of a hassle on Tuesday morning, but I'm going to be Omaha bound on Saturday, and I'll be in Omaha as long as Tennessee stays and Tennessee is active and playing in the College World Series. So you'll have complete coverage firsthand of the Tennessee Vols in the College World Series right here on Locked On Vols uh, from Omaha. So more on that in segment three. Okay, so uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, we're going to kind of get into some of these polls that a lot of us host on Locked On uh, SEC, if you will, Locked On Network. We all contributed, okay? So they sent out these polls and they said, hey, you know, top five fan bases, top five college football programs, top five offenses, top five coaches, uh, top five head coaches, all this type of stuff. They did a whole lot, you know, for this upcoming football season of 2023. And there's a lot to get into, and we're going to reference a lot of these as uh, the weeks go on. But I pulled five of these that I want to reference here today because I got I got a bone to pick with a lot of these, all right? And I would love to get your interaction. I'd love to get your thoughts on this as well. Um, if you um, have a comment on, on, on how my colleagues and I voted, uh, please let us know. Um, but, of course, I only have one vote. So let's start at the top. Um, I'm going to flash a graphic up here if you're watching on YouTube. But, of course, if you're listening, I'll, I'll tell you what it says. Uh, this is the top five athletic programs entering the 2023 academic year. So it kind of goes in what we were just talking about and how there's cohesiveness with the university, uh, the administrations, the athletic departments. And um, it's, you know, it'd be hard pressed to find a better year at Tennessee ever than, than right now, right? Except if you go back to 1998, maybe in some of those late 90 years. But if you look at SEC wide and, and the host from Locked On SEC, myself included. This is kind of how we voted. Top five athletic programs in the SEC entering the new season. Number one, Alabama. Number two, LSU. Number three, Georgia. Number four, Arkansas. And number five, Tennessee. Um, without getting into the nitty gritty and breaking down sport by sport and revenue by revenue and all that type of stuff, I understand Alabama. Um, Alabama is you know, one, one of the best football programs uh, in the country every single year. It's got a really, really good basketball program. Spent a lot of time as the number one ranked Basketball team in the country this past year, I get that. Got an incredible softball team. Uh, baseball team made it to super regional or made it to regional play as well. So I, I get Alabama. Um, LSU, decent football team. Going to be better in 2023. I recognize that. Basketball had a down year for sure. Softball, 
uh, pretty decent there. Baseball, one of the best teams in the country, and of course, that's who Tennessee plays in Omaha uh, to get the College World Series off for the Volunteers. So LSU is pretty well rounded as well. Georgia, back to back national champions, okay, in football. I get that. Baseball, blah. Basketball, blah. You know, softball is okay. You know, I, I I don't quite understand Georgia. Does football carry that much weight? I guess it does. Number four is Arkansas. Interesting. Arkansas, okay in football. Arkansas's good in baseball, but of course didn't make it out. Uh, didn't make it to to Omaha, of course. Uh, softball is pretty solid. Men's basketball is solid. You know, top fifteen team. Women's basketball is there as well. And then you have Tennessee. I think Tennessee should be at least three on this list for everything that we just kind of talked about. Okay, you know, you know, this past year, the twenty twenty two academic year, uh, New Year's Six bowl game, Orange Bowl champions. That's Tennessee, right? Sweet sixteen, both men's and women's. Uh, women's College World Series for softball. Men's College World Series for uh, for baseball in Omaha. Um, I think Tennessee should at least be three on this list. That's just me, but uh, my peers and I voted this top five athletic programs. I think I voted Tennessee three is how I voted it, but Alabama one, LSU two, Georgia three, Arkansas four, and Tennessee is at number five. Okay, this is the one that really, really grinds my gears, if you will. Top five fan bases. Number one, LSU. Number two, Georgia. Number three, Auburn. Number four, Alabama. Number five, Arkansas. Tennessee didn't even make the top five. Are you kidding me? I mean, say what you want about Tennessee. Say what you want about Vol Twitter. Say what you want about the crazies. I make a living off of Tennessee fans. I am grateful for Tennessee fans. Every single one of you, even the ones that piss me off and annoy me to no end on the general's quarters, I love everyone because you guys allow me to do what I love to do and what I'm passionate about. It's, it's talking to this microphone, talking to this camera right now. Okay, say what you want about Vol Twitter going overboard. Say what you want about the Tennessee fan base going too far or always you know, thinking it's it's us against the world or whatever. But to tell me that Tennessee is not a top five fan base in the Southeastern Conference, it's absolute ludicrous. It is absolute ludicrous. Hell, Tennessee could be number one on this list, in my opinion. And there's bias everywhere, okay? The Georgia host voted Georgia one, I'm sure. The Alabama host Voted Alabama number one, I'm sure. The LSU host, I'm sure it's the same way. Okay, I, I get it. But how in the world, how in the world is Tennessee not considered in this poll a top five fan base in the Southeastern Conference? It's ludicrous. It's pathetic. <laughs> and I completely, completely disagree with this. Number one, LSU. Number two, Georgia. Number three, Auburn. Number four, Alabama. Number five, Arkansas. Great fan bases. Electric. They all make SEC what it is. I love it. Wouldn't have it any other way. There ain't no way in hell Tennessee's fan base isn't higher than Auburn. Ain't no way in hell, in my opinion, Tennessee's fan base isn't higher than Arkansas number five. That is just me right there. Uh, so that's the one that really, really gets me that I don't agree with. But again, uh, we're going on here. I'd love to hear your feedback. And there's there's plenty more of these that we did, and I voted on a lot of these. And they did it for all the conferences, Big Ten, Big 12. Pac-12, ACC, along with the SEC. So um, we, we can share those graphics here as well as we, if we want. Top five SEC football programs entering the 2023 season. I mean, if you go to FanDuel's you know, futures, it's pretty much the top five here. Georgia's at one, Alabama's at two, LSU's at three, Tennessee's at four, Ole Miss is at five. I don't have a big gripe with this. Uh, Georgia back-to-back -back national champions. Okay, Alabama's roster still where it is. Gotcha. Um, LSU and Tennessee, you can have the conversation if you can flip-flop those right there, but LSU is going to get the benefit over the Dow because LSU, it's a trendy, trendy pick this offseason. Everybody loves the Tigers. Everybody loves Jaden Daniels. Everybody loves Brian Kelly. Remember on Locked on Vols, Brian Kelly, great football coach, but I can't hear you guys. Scumbag of a human being. Um, but anyway, um, I have no issue with this. Again, Georgia 1, Alabama 2, LSU 3, Tennessee 4. Ole Miss is number five. Maybe there's a conversation there at number five, but entering the 2023 season, top five SEC football programs, pretty much copy and paste from the FanDuel Futures, the totals, and Tennessee sitting there tied for third, but number four on this list. I don't really have an issue with this. Uh, kind of rolling on into the top five offenses. Again, these are locked on SEC hosts, myself included, kind of ranking these as we go on. Top five football offenses entering the 2023 season. Number one is Georgia. 
Interesting. Interesting. Um, Georgia, we know Georgia because of its defense. Georgia has got was a really, really good offense last year, sure, but um, lost all the talent to the National Football League, lost its quarterback in Stetson Bennett, even though I've said plenty of times, and I'll stand by this, they will upgrade talent-wise at the quarterback position, but a lot of inexperience there. Um, but Georgia's number one. LSU's at number two. That's interesting, okay? You got John, Na- or, um, gosh, Neighbors, the wide receiver, really, really good. You're bringing back Jaden Daniels, who I think is a pretty decent quarterback. LSU at number two, though. That's interesting. Tennessee comes in at number three, and I, I'm okay with that because look at all you lost. You lost your quarterback in Hendon Hooker. You lost uh, Cedric Tillman. You lost Jalen Hyatt. You lost a lot of weapons. You lost Darnell Wright. You lost a lot of weapons and some really solid players on offense. I hear you here, but if you just go look at Josh Heupel's track record, and Josh Heupel is a head coach and offensive coordinator at the Power 5 level, and of course the head coach at the Group of 5 stop as well, he has always had a top 10 offense. So I don't care what it looks like. I think Tennessee will have a top 10 offense this year. So um, Tennessee getting the third pick here, that's okay. I'm fine with that. Number four is Ole Miss with Lane Kiffin. Kiffin. And number five is Alabama. It's going to be interesting. Alabama's roster is loaded. I get it. I think Alabama will revert back to its old Alabama ways, where it relies on mediocre quarterback play. Who's going to be the quarterback there? Um, where it runs the football and really relies on some elite defenses. The last thing I want to discuss here, and please give me your reactions. Let me know what you think about these uh, votings for these polls that myself and my colleagues did over at Locked On SEC. Last one would be top five quarterbacks in the SEC. Okay, we talk about all these numerous polls and lists and all that in the offseason. This is just another one, right? This is just done by our friends over at Locked On, myself included. Number one, K.J. Jefferson? Okay, come on now. I like K.J. Jefferson. I think he's a good player, but best quarterback in the league? Granted, you lost a lot of quarterback talent. I'll give you that. You lost a whole lot of quarterback talent in the SEC from last year. But KJ Jefferson, number one. Jaden Daniels, two. I think he's in the conversation as number as number one. Carson Beck, three. Are you serious right now? He very well might end up being one of the better quarterbacks in the Southeastern Conference. But dude hadn't played. Okay. So why in the world is Carson Beck showing up on an offseason list in the top five when you're talking quarterbacks in the Southeastern Conference? That is ludicrous, in my opinion. Do I think he'll be good at Georgia? Absolutely. He's got toys to play with. They're going to keep him protected. But should he be number three on this list right now? Heck no. One, K.J. Jefferson. Two, Jaden Daniels. Three, Carson Beck. Four is Will Rogers. Production, 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 production. I like Will Rogers. I'll be interested to see, of course, with um, you know the Pirate no longer with us, how that will affect uh, the offense and Will Rogers moving forward at Mississippi State. So I'm, I'm interested to see that. And then number five is Joe Milton. You can go into a number of different uh, you know, categories here in the top five. Joe Milton's in that conversation with Spencer Rattler, in my opinion, with Devin Leary, in my opinion. Uh, there, there, there's, there's some guys that could be in there instead of Carson Beck or, or, hear me out, instead of Joe Milton. But the fact that Joe Milton's there at number five, he's been a starter at two Power 5 programs, looked really, really good in mop-up duty and in the starting role in place of Hendon Hooker last year. Joe Milton is a top five quarterback in the Southeastern Conference entering the 2023 season. And the fact that he's number five on this this list, I have no issue with. The one thing I do have an issue with is that Carson Beck is number three. You got to be freaking kidding me. All right. Those were five of the most interesting polls that um, you know myself and my colleagues around the SEC at Locked On kind of voted on. I will bring some more on as the week goes on. And let me know what you think about the fan base one. Jeez. The quarterback one, the head coaches one, all that and more. Uh, let me know what you think. When we come back, Tennessee baseball is on to Omaha. Let's hear that final out call in the Super Regional uh, from the Ball Radio Network's John Wilkerson. And take a look at that bracket, Tennessee and LSU, and then Tennessee and who. That's coming up next right here on Locked on Balls. All right, guys, we got a final segment left here of this Wednesday edition of Locked on Balls. Appreciate you guys being here. And uh, being everydayer, shout out everydayers and uh, everything you guys give to uh, the program. Thanks for sticking around. We need to get that time spent listening metric up there a little bit. Uh, that is on me. So if you guys are watching this on YouTube, listening to this, let's, let's listen to uh, the, the whole thing. At least have it on in the background, right? Let's help, let's help those metrics out just a little bit. Um, but really pleased where the show is right now. And of course, it's all because of you guys. Um, the off season's a grind. It really, really is. Uh, doing this during football season is a joy, and it's super, super easy. I'm going to be honest with you. You make your money's worth, and you find out how good of a personality and a journalist you are 
uh, during the months of May and June. That is for dang sure. Uh, but I love doing it. That's why we're doing it. And uh, I'm thankful to be doing it with you guys every single day. Let's talk more Tennessee baseball. Um, I came on there, guys. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm covering the Tennessee baseball team for VolQuest.com. Uh, it's a grind, uh, especially postseason play. I'm living out of a suitcase right now. Literally, I got back. Um, suitcase is sitting on the bed, but it, it's um, you know the stuff that – a lot of it's not coming out of the suitcase because I'm trying to ride around. I'm going to Omaha on Saturday. <laughs> so it's been fun, though. Um, but when Tennessee won – Amidst all the rain delays, over 23 hours of rain delays this past weekend at Southern Miss, the Super Regional. Uh, Tennessee's game was pushed back to after 10 o'clock Eastern time, 9 o'clock local time. And the game didn't end until after midnight local time, 1 a.m. Eastern time. And by the time I got done doing post-game press conferences and my stand-up on the field and the stuff I had to get out initially, I came in here and I did a I did a mini call, mini pod with Brent Hubs over at VolQuest.com. And then I, I recorded the second half of our uh, – our Tuesday show. And I wanted to make sure that I recorded win or lose the second half of the Tuesday show talking baseball because it's, it's very important. Um, but it was, it was about two 30 in the morning guys. <laughs> and so, um, it was, I was delirious a little bit. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys probably knew that, but wanted to go back and revisit some of the highlights of the weekend. And of course, Tennessee punches this ticket to Omaha for the sixth time in program history, the second time in three years and, uh, scored 13 unanswered runs, uh, on Southern Miss, after Southern Miss took a 4 nothing lead in the third inning of Game 2, Tennessee went the rest of the way, outscoring the Golden Eagles 13 to nothing, and finally punching its ticket to Omaha. And how did it sound? How did it sound via the airwaves of the Ball Radio Network? My guy, John Wilkerson, had the call, and this is what it sounded like. John Wilkerson on the Ball Radio Network as Tennessee is back in Omaha. The 1-1. Line to first. Caught on the fly by Blake Burke. That's the inning. That's the ball game. And the Super Regional belongs to the Tennessee Volunteers. While the Golden Eagles threaten in the top of the ninth, no runs across for Southern Miss. And in the inning, no runs, no hits, one error, two men left. This incredible journey that has been the Tennessee Baseball 2023 campaign will end in Omaha. First stop, Clemson. Second stop, Hattiesburg. Next stop, Omaha. Hello, win column. Hello, Super Regional. And hello, World Series. Final score, Tennessee 5, Southern Miss nothing. This indeed is Tennessee baseball. This indeed is Tennessee baseball. God, you got to love it. Gotta love it. You guys know my background. If not, uh, if you're new to the program, if you're new every day or don't know my program, I spent five years in radio at the Sports Animal, Knoxville, Tennessee. I worked alongside John Wilkerson, who is literally not only one of the most talented people in terms of talking behind the microphone that I've ever met, but one of the kindest and good-natured individuals that you will ever meet. Everything you hear about John Wilkerson, which I know is good, is absolutely true. And... Uh, man, he, he's the best. And so when I was, when we're sitting in the press box, right, we're, we're, we're at a Southern Miss. And so I'm sitting on the end and there is a glass window. Okay. I'm on the end. There's a glass window to my right. And right on the other side of that glass window, it's John and he's calling the game. So it was soundproof, but you know, when he got really, really excited, I could hear it just a little bit and I could see him moving around and I could see the emotion. Yeah. The SID Sean Barrows and Max Potter, uh, sitting beside him. And so, I mean, that booth was going nuts it was really, really fun to watch, and you know, John, you know, obviously go back and you know work alongside him the last couple of years, and so, you know, throughout the weekend we'd exchange some looks through the through the glass a little bit, and so it was really, really cool to. I literally had a front row seat to watching that call, um, and, and so I just thought it was really, really cool. So, um, a lot of you guys were wanting to hear that. I know you probably have already heard that, but uh, no issue at all to hear it again. Am I right? John Wilkerson, courtesy of the Vol Radio Network. So. Now, Tennessee punches its ticket to Omaha, and it is one of the final eight teams remaining in contention to win a title, okay? Um, talked a little bit about the season in a whole last last night or, or on the podcast on yesterday's show, uh, you know, staring 5-10 and 10 in the face going into the Vanderbilt series, winning that game in extra innings. That was the turning point, how this team's gotten better, figured out its outfield rotation, figured out the catcher position, figured out its lineup, uh, put together quality of bats after quality of bats, made the move to Andrew Lindsay, 
uh, to the number one spot on weekends, and then Chase Burns to the bullpen, and just kind of putting all those puzzle pieces together. And now you're seeing the finished product, right? And Tennessee's playing its best baseball at the number one time of the year. Remember when Tennessee was um, one and thirteen on the road? Remember when Tennessee was five and fourteen away from Lindsey Nelson Stadium, entering regional play? And that stat doesn't even matter right now. Last two weeks away from Lindsey Nelson Stadium, you are five and one. Uh, man, I mean, how, how it's just evolution evolving. Uh, that's what the Tennessee baseball team is doing. And now you're punching your ticket and you're back in Omaha and you will square off against LSU. Tennessee was the last ticket punch, by the way, because of all the freaking rain delays. Um, and because of all the rain delays and because of the incident delays incompetence, I won't go in on that again. I know I did. I think I did. I can't remember which podcast I did it on. I think I did it on this one. Um, just absolute clown show, Mick Mouth's organization, not Southern Miss, the NCAA and ESPN, uh, just pathetic, a horrible, 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 um, great example of what the NCAA is, was this weekend, mind you. And I know a lot of people, and I know a lot of me, uh, media members around the country and everything kind of got tired of people like me in the, in the Tennessee media this week, but I mean, point blank was pathetic. And, and, you know, if you want to talk to me about it more, just DM me, but uh, I won't waste your time on it any, anymore, but Anyway, Tennessee was the last ticket punch, and because of that, because of the rain delays, uh, all the media blocks were taken, and so I'm trying to find lodging, and it's expensive as hell. But Tennessee will score off against LSU in the first game. And how the College World Series works, okay, there's two brackets. You know, if you, if you know how postseason works for baseball, you go to regional play. Four teams battling it out to see who's the last team standing in double elimination. That team goes on to super regionals and you play the best of a three game series. So Omaha takes both of that. You have two brackets. So when play gets going on Friday in Omaha, you're going to have two different brackets going. One bracket will play on Friday and Sunday. The other bracket will play on Saturday and Monday. Tennessee's will be on Saturday and Monday. You have two regionals going on at the same time, if you will. On this side of the bracket, Tennessee's going up against LSU on Saturday, and the game before that will be Stanford and Wake Forest. On the other side of the bracket, it will be Florida and Virginia going up against each other, and Oral Roberts and TCU. Uh, the team that wins that quote-unquote regional double elimination will advance on to the College World Series and take on the winner of the other bracket, the final, and it will be a best of a two, of a three-game series. So. It all kind of ties in together, but no doubts about it. Tennessee's off to Omaha, but it got a tough, tough, tough draw. You look at this. LSU, Paul Skeens, Dylan Cruz, Trey Morgan, Brady Neal, all those guys. They are a good ball club, and Paul Skeens is going to get the ball against Tennessee on Saturday night, likely against Andrew Lindsay, maybe against Chase Dolander, but probably Andrew Lindsay. It's going to be a great, great contest. Uh, Tennessee is a completely different ball club than what it was down at Allen Box Stadium, down in the Bayou uh, at the beginning of SEC play. It got swept. What's funny about that is Tennessee outscored LSU in that three-game series, but got swept. Or, or no, it didn't get swept. Excuse me. It, it, it salvaged game three. But Tennessee beat itself in games one and game two. It's a different ball club right now. Um, and you look at MLB Pipeline's top you know, draft picks, the number one prospect, uh, draft prospect right now is Dylan Cruz, the outfielder. Number two is Paul Skeens, the right-handed pitcher who will throw 200 pitches against Tennessee if need be. Um, you've got Grant Taylor, who's a right-handed pitcher. You've got um, Trey Morgan, the first baseman I mentioned, who's a really, really good player. Uh, you've got a lot of good players uh, in terms that, that kind of show up on that MLB you know, top draft prospects for this upcoming draft, first-year players draft in uh, late, later in July. So it's going to be a really, really good game between Tennessee and LSU. But if you uh, you know, win, lose, whatever, you're going to have to play likely Wake Forest at some point. Wake Forest and Stanford will be on the other t the other game on that side of the bracket. Wake Forest was the number one team for much of the season. LSU, the number one team for the first part of the season. Preseason number one and number two is LSU and Tennessee. And that's going to be, again, another little storyline. So Tennessee got a tough draw. No ifs, ands, and buts about it, but again, as we'll continue to talk about on tomorrow's show and on Friday's show, Tennessee is built to win at this time of the year because of pitching. Arms on arms on arms. And if Tennessee is going to lose a game, if Tennessee were to lose a game, say you drop that game against LSU because of the arms, you, are, you have the potential to climb out of the loser's bracket and still win. It'd be tough. It would be really, really tough, but Tennessee is positioned to do just that. So, um... 
Tennessee going to Omaha again. You heard the call from John Wilkerson, second time in three seasons, six times over, six time overall, 1951, 1995, 2001, uh, 2005, or 2000, let me start over, 1951, 1995, 2005, 2001, 2021, and 2023. There we go. And, uh, yeah, let's see what happens, man. I'm, I'm excited. I'm really, really excited. Can't wait to see that environment in Omaha, Nebraska for the College World Series. Guys, thank you so much for joining us here on Locked On Vols. Can't thank you enough for being an everyday or coming back and supporting the show. If you're not an everyday or come back tomorrow and figure it out what it is, thanks so much for making Locked On Vols your first listen each and every day. If you haven't already, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Odyssey. Subscribe to Locked On Vols on the YouTube channel. Can't thank you guys enough at underscore Kaner and at Locked On Vols. We will do it again tomorrow. This is Locked On Vols.